we brought in a 1970 Dodge Challenger convertible, 318, plum crazy car, a neat car, rusty car, rough car. I had made a deal with the gentleman who owned the green 70 RTSE to restore it. At the time, I felt I could probably restore it. Over the years, we've been moving the car around, waiting for it to get into queue, waiting for it to get into queue. And every time we move the car, it weighs a little less because of the rust, something shakes off of it. I was really worried about its ability to be restored. Worried enough that I had Tony D'Agostino, when he was out here, go around the car and try to give me an objective, optimistic, if he can, view of the car and should it be restored. I know he says it's a rough car, but still, it's an e-body convertible is the number one desirable type car. To make things even tougher for me to make that decision, Brian, when he was out doing an interview for the RTSE, he talked about that car and what that car meant to him and how it had been a part of his life. My name is Brian Landsberg. I'm from Wadsworth, Illinois. In the late 90s, mid 90s, I bought this convertible behind me. So after I purchased the car and had it for a while, nobody around did Mopar restorations and this one was in need of much more work than the, the other car that I have. I decided to go ahead and cut that car loose and the car had been sitting in this guy's backyard since 1999. And I got a flatbed, made a deal, wrenched the car out, shipped it to Mark and that's the start of this journey. You know, it's a sad fact that we can't save them all. I wish we could. You see all the cars in here? We're gonna save all of them. I wish I could save everyone in the world, but we can't. It's a sad fact. We just can't save them all. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible. Finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman. His cousin, Doug. His daughter, Alyssa. His best friend, Royal. His painter, Will. And the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest fiercest and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. Okay. So the steering wheel horn. Steering that, wheel, I don't know if it'll clean up. You've cleaned up a lot more wheels. If that's, it's well, not it's cracked. Not the, no, believe it or not, the wheel doesn't matter because you can put that other piece on another wheel. No, I know, but I'm just wondering how the overall oh, shape of it. The wheel is worthless. Now, the other reason I had Tony looking at this car with me is that he knows parts. Because let's face it, if we didn't restore the car, then what do we do with it? Crush it? Well, there's parts of it we'll crush, but there's a lot of good parts on it. Tony is a parts guy. Tony's Mopar parts has been around since I was a kid. We were both kids in this business starting out. I knew I could trust him to tell me what the value of the parts were, what the marketability was, and then at the end of that, we could add all those things up and come up with the prices. Hey, this thing worth more dead than alive. Outside door handles, this one's in really nice shape. I know they make the new ones now, so is it safe? I sell thing? NOS pair for $165. So it's well, worth 50 bucks for a pair of used ones, maybe 25. You're never gonna sell them, you're never gonna use them. So as I was watching back through this episode, some of the old material that I hadn't seen in a while, and you guys are watching it right now, uh, kind of a recap of when Tony was out, I noticed that my hunch about him being negative is not wrong. He is a very negative person. Now, that's a pretty good hood. I looked at it the other day when I was walking around it. It's a flat hood, which they're making into the shakers. Not anymore, because they make the shake that you could buy the hood now from AMD. Yeah, well. So, I mean, and by the time you buy the stuff to convert it, you're at the new hood. He's also, I can't say anything. Every single thing I say, he can't just let it be. If I say the sun's out, he goes, yeah, that their sun's out, but uh, that their sun isn't very hot. You know. Well, in this case, follow me around. Hey, Tony, I think this is worth this. Boom. You gotta put a value on that somewhere, right? You well, could, hey, look, they don't make convertible quarters now. You could, you could hey, come. Mark. No, they don't. Hey, Tony, I think this should be over here. And then a little bit later when they knew they were doing the AER, they put those in, but they didn't get rid of those. Except for this would be a TA. And every time I say something, bam, he's back with a no, that's not true. Yeah, it would be a TA. There's no AER challenger. No, no. However, that's speaking of bad. that. That's pretty bad, huh? Yeah, you have to stoop to that level. Sad. I just tried to talk about polishing the moldings on the windshield. Um, and those being really nice, you'd probably have them polished and get I don't have full them, no, no, no. If I have them polished, 
then they go, oh, it's not just right. No, that's not what I do. I don't do that there. I don't uh, I do not do that there. Let somebody else decide that. Just hand them the moldings. Let them see it, because no matter what you do, it's never going to be good enough. Okay, I get it. I'm sorry I said anything. I would have put three or $400 on a donor dash. I mean, that's what you'd charge me for one. I just wonder what. Mm. Real number. If the dash pad core is worth something, I guess you could be generous and give 300 bucks for it. Yeah, but is that what you'd sell it to Mark Warman for? One of the things I thought was kind of funny, I called him on it a couple of times and he shut me down. Yeah, don't do that there. Don't do that. 150 bucks. And why'd you charge me 400 for the last two I bought? Because they were better. Was the fact that some of the parts that I was getting prices on, steering wheels and moldings and stuff, he's charging me more than he's paying for them. But our deal is he's supposed to sell them to me at the price he pays for them. Complete steering column without the steering wheel. Complete power steering. Good, good, complete column. 175 dollars. And then when I called him out, I yeah, yeah, that, that there, uh, yeah, yeah, the stop mark, that there. You charged me 350 for the last one I bought. Stop. Give me a sandwich. No, whatever. The fact is, on this car, all of its value really resides in its parts. The convertible top mechanism, the windshield, the cowl, the things that make it a convertible, the tops of the quarters, that section isn't rotted out, so you could easily take the parts off of this car and make a hard top challenger into a convertible. All of its value now, other than the sentimental part, and I can't do anything about that, resides in the value of the parts. You know, retail, I would, I would sell a convertible top frame you know, for around two grand. The metal corners. Stamped metal. The Got cor it. And the center piece that runs across. Got okay? it. Okay. Yep. Uh, those three pieces also, that's probably 1300 Wow. Retail. Wow. What would you give me for that uh, spare tire? Nothing, but the jack hook would have been worth something except for <laughs> I, I came out. Tony's with making these now, so they're not worth much. Tony and I kind of go round and round and bicker back and forth and stuff. Usually it's just one upsmanship. You know, you're trying to get the other guy in a mistake. And, Aha, I got gotcha. you. We're taking two different roads to get to the same place. But do you agree, sadly, with me overall, that it's just, it's done? Okay. The funeral march. In this particular case, we both merged at the end and came up with the agreement that the car couldn't be saved. And because it couldn't be saved, I had to make that dreaded phone call to the owner and let him know, look, it's not gonna make it. It was sad about the Challenger. It would have been a really cool car to restore but it was just too far gone. Every time we moved that car around, it lost 50 pounds of rust. We can't save them all, and that really sucks. It always hurts for me to have to say a car isn't restorable like this one, but it hurts a little bit worse when the guy has all of the paperwork that you would love to have on a Hemi car or on a six-pack car. He had the broadcast sheet, the fender tag, the door, a VIN label on it, the dash VIN was there. He had a breakdown showing it was one of only one ever built with that color combination in a convertible. He had the original point of purchase invoice for the car. So it does really hurt when you have to knock something like that out. Well, this little car was given to us last year. It was part of those California fires. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do with it. Right, Dougie? So recently, a fan of the show donated a 73 Challenger Rally that had been in the California fires. Mark and I looked over the car, and there was absolutely nothing on the car that we could salvage. We took it over to a local recycler and had it crushed. Some of the cars out here are better than what Dougie's driving. So, of course, Mark had to film that to torture me. You know, it was a Challenger rally, but look at how you can just see the sag in it. Right there is the cowl. That's how hot that thing got. It sagged in the middle. It just toast. That was ridiculous. I do that just to torture Dougie. There it goes, Dougie. Like I ain't got something better to do than torture Dougie. Yeah, I do it partially to torture him. There goes the hot rod. Oh, man, it was hot, wasn't it? Burned some marshmallows in that was car. nicer than your barracuda <laughs> when you got rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. Better than any car I've ever owned. Oh, those look better. But I also do it because I make it into a little three minute video. Bye bye, little challenger. I put it on our Facebook page, www.facebook forward slash graveyard cars, and I get paid. I monetize it. Bumps and burners, nice little earners. Cash. Krugerrands, as they said in Lethal Weapon. Money. <laughs> You know, we're getting a lot of cars really pumped out of the paint shop right now. I've been with Mark for 25, 26 years. This is the best crew we've ever had. We joke a lot, we pick on them a lot, all that silly and fun stuff. Michael, meet sweats. You like yeah. that still? No. 
You don't, you don't like it? Prefer yeah. cornbread? Yeah, over all of them. We still call him Michael Meat Sweats because he still eats a lot of meat and he sweats a lot. And that's why he's got the gloves on. It's like a nervous habit, I think. I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> okay, we well, can't um, really rust primer. Well, then why do you have gloves on? I don't know. Safety precautions. Safety from what? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but what it comes down to, everyone's just kind of found their place. I have the metal shop doing the best work they've ever done. We have our Bondo guys. We have a younger guy and we have an older guy that work great together. And both of them are doing about a car every two weeks. I have my helper Noah that's been with me for a while and my son Brody who's learning. So this is the, honest to God, the first time we were just doing a great job. So when you're converting one of the muscle cars over to accept one of the late model crate engines and transmissions like the Silver Sport six speed, there are provisions you have to do to these cars. One of the biggest ones, converting that floor over to be able to accommodate that six speed transmission. It's a bigger transmission, bigger bell housing area than what the cars came with. So we have to raise it way up high and open it up. There are actually templates. If you look carefully there, you'll see there's some templates that are put down on the floor. We have to bring the floor up, cut it open, bring the floor up to that height, add whatever material is necessary Necessary, weld it back up again, seam seal it, and then it's ready for paint. You know, this car is actually pretty cool to do. I'm super excited about it. It's a tribute car. It started life as a 71 Challenger 318 car. And we've done Hemi Orange a bunch, so some things aren't as exciting, but with this particular car, Hemi Orange, Hellcat, Orange Stripe, beautiful interior work. We painted the underside also, which is different. So it's a tribute, but with like a graveyard car's twist on it. This is something the customers wanted his whole life. I do not mind doing tribute cars as long as everybody in the world, those at home and those are the people that are buying it, know it's not a real car. The original car we're basing this one on was actually a 446 pack four speed 71 Challenger RT. EV2 Hemi Orange with the orange side stripe. It's actually in the book, the orange longitudinal stripe. So when this car is done, you compare it to the pictures that the guy sent me that we're building the car for of what the original car looked like. It should be an identical twin. And to me, I think that's just the coolest thing. There's only one of those other cars and some guy, I believe he's in Canada, owns that one. This is gonna be another one. The big difference is it's gonna have the Hell Crate 707 horsepower engine in it, like we put in our Hellbird, the Superbird. The six speed Silver Sport transmission, manual shifted with the pistol grip, everything looking like it should. First gear, second, there's the supercharger kicking in. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> With the Mosier Dana 354 rear end, the rest of the car 100% the way it could have come from the factory. So for the sealer, I do two coats of the DP90. By the time I get done going around the car once, it's almost time to go around it again. So that gives me my two coats there, fills any of the imperfections, light scratches. Then at that point, I'm ready for my color. So when I go to paint this car, it's all done in base coat, clear coat. We used to do it in single stage, and I've always done it that way. Problem with that, you kind of run into, it's got a metallic in it. So when you go to cut and buff it, it has to be done just a certain way. Otherwise, you'll move the metallic, kind of like on our Daytona hood, that I had to repaint base clear. So it's what I've done is really got this formula dialed in. Base coat version is just spot on to what the original was. So for all you people at home that want to know how to do this, in PPG, that's all I can speak of, that's all I know. First toner is DMD 617, DMD 618, DMD 1686, DMD 1687, and lastly, DBX 1689. You mix all that together and you will get a perfect EV2 Hemi Orange base coat. See it? This slow motion stuff, you stop it. It's your fault. You talk to those editors. If I see another thing with Will doing slow motion stuff, I'm gonna absolutely vomit. So stop the slow-mo. Sever the bloodline. Ensure the bloodline.
base coat version of this, you're looking at five, six, seven coats. Takes a little bit, especially that DP90 is black. So orange over black takes a little bit longer to do. Then once that process is complete, I grab the DCU 2002, put three coats of clear on it, and we're done. On this 1971 Challenger, we've got the engine compartment all painted. Looks beautiful. We still have all the jam work to do inside the trunk, inside the cab, because Mark told me the wrong color to paint it to start, so I gotta go back and paint it the right color. Engine compartment's done. The cab is done. There. We're There's gonna get damn jammed dinner. out. There's your dinner, as soon as the, I just wanna get through my day. Point. This is that Zagnut I'll have Shane bar. come over, Eat the hang bar. the fenders, hang the doors, hang ah, the hood, well, you're feeling kind like of it. do like a final fitment type thing. You remember? And then at when, that point, 48 we'll hours, block, we'll get the when they get in the big fight at the end and old Nolte saying, now your boys came then once it's painted, painted, grass when they I'll have did, Noah but, come over, get the cut That's your character. Once the cut and buff is done, We'll push you it say, over. I was about to we'll get push your it ass over. Gates. <laughs> After you throw we'll, it in the garbage. We'll push it over to assembly. I've noticed with these movie references, he's always like, the, you know, the number one. He's the cool guy, the hero, whatever. And I'm like the villain or some other things that I can't repeat. But I'm always seem to be lesser than him in these movie roles. You ever play roulette? Always bet on black. I'm Axel Foley. He's Victor Maitland. You know, lethal weapon. He's Mo Gibson. He's coming out of the smoke on the motorcycle with the fog machines, and he's great, and it's all good. And I'm like Gary Busey. It doesn't work out. You know, he's got some cool moments, you know, when they held the fire to his arm, but then he, he got killed at the end. I think one time I'd like to maybe be the main guy, you know? He's Mr. Joshua, all right? I'm Mel Gibson with the nice ass drinking the beer naked in the trailer with my dog down on the beach. Okay, that's me, all right? He pushed Amanda Hunsaker out the damn window, for all I know. Why can't I be Jack Nicholson from A Few Good Men and Mark could be like Demi Moore? No, 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 I'm, I'm Colonel Jessup. You saw the animation. There's a whole animation where I'm actually Colonel Jessup. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to them. Do you want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Son, we live in a world that has colors. And those colors have to be mixed by men with paint guns. Who's going to do it? You? He's just jealous. You don't get to flip the script like that. And I'm going to be what, Demi Moore? That's ridiculous. I'm Caffey. If anything, I'm Caffey. He says, I'm tired of you treating me like this, and I want to go somewhere nice to eat. And, you, and, and Kate says, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm hungry. And he puts the money in the machine. And he pulls him out of his Agnet bar. I didn't have his Agnet. It's a protein bar, but so. So is what's really cool, like we talked about in season 14 and the start of this season, is I, I'm One producing, about me is I I'm producing this show now. Boom, and I hit you in the head. So I can just shut this down at any point. So Pete, go ahead and cut. Shut what down? You're not going to do anything. Caleb, go ahead and shut what audio. Are you doing, convict? And we're good for, You're for go this bit. You're about to go back to prison, convict. And if it was American Werewolf in London, I'd be Jack, right? I'd be Jack, he'd be David. I'd be the guy who got victimized by some wild ass sociopathic wolf, bloodthirsty damn thing, tears me to pieces while he's running. Not walking away from helping me, running. Hero, villain. That's why I went back to haunt him later. So, oh, excuse me. We've caught. Yeah. We've caught. 48 hours, convict. Previously on Graveyard Cars, we restored this gorgeous, stunning 1971 Dodge Challenger RT. What option was it that made this car one of only one ever produced? Was it the 383 Magnum, the air conditioning, or the formal roof? Stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. How did you do on that one? Our beautiful 1971 Dodge Challenger RT is one of only one ever built. Why is that? What option made it that way? If you said the air conditioning, you were wrong. It is the formal back roof. Air conditioning was an option, H51. The 383 Magnum, that was standard. That certainly wouldn't make a car one of one. But the A78 formal roof brought this car down with its colors and other options to a one of only one ever built. This car also featured leather seats, the standard rally instrument cluster, 
and the standard black RT stripes. Like I mentioned earlier, we were just pumping these cars out. So when it came to like the hood, the trunk, the balances on our black Challenger, wasn't interested in the silly paint off or anything for that matter. So at this point, I just come in early, get them painted, get them done, get them buffed and get them on the car. On this particular one, I went ahead and just sealed it black. It covers a little bit quicker, but it's black, so it covers fast anyways, but it does hide all the imperfections. So one good coat of sealer, four coats of the black single stage, and they came out gorgeous. You know, when it comes to this car, the car is going black. That means there's no room for air. Your body line's on the side. The way you block out the car, body lines and bulges that are on the hood, there's just no room for air. I use the 9300 black single stage paint right out of the can, it's ready to go. As long as your prep work is what it should be, which ours is, my paint job will be great. The finished product of this car will be amazing. So when I did this color, I did it with four coats. I wanted to put an extra coat on just because I really wanted to lay it out, make it look just really that good, sheet of glass type good. But now that that's done, I'll let that sit for a couple weeks. We'll cut and buff it, wash everything up, and then assemble the car. One of the things that the guy wanted to do that the original car did not have on this Challenger was he wanted the bottom of it painted. That's a lot of work. It's an enormous amount of work. By the time you're done going in and out of all the crevices, getting them prepped, getting them sanded, then getting them painted, cleaned up, and ready to go, you could have 100, maybe 200 hours doing the bottom side of this car. So when it came to shooting the underside of our orange 71, it was a little trickier. A, the prep work has to be just like the outside of the car because you are painting it. Two, it's a little bit more challenging because there's a bunch of cracks and crevices that can very easily miss, so you really gotta take your time on it. And the third part about this is you don't cut and buff it. How it looks when you hang your gun up and walk out, it needs to be perfect. You're not gonna get in there and do all that buffing where you can't reach. So it's more technical, more time consuming, but the payoff is huge because it's gonna look amazing. It's not that we're not used to doing paintwork on the bottom of a car, but when we do it, it's usually to emulate the factory dipping process. So if you go back to Brett Torino's gorgeous, one of two ever built 1970 Coronet RT convertible 426 semi four speed cars, that one got painted the gray, the factory simulated gray on the bottom. Then when you paint the outside of the car, the color just blows in on it. Very natural, very OEM looking. Cindy D'Agostino 70 Challenger RT, we did the same thing. We've done it a few times. The nice thing about that primer that you're putting on the bottom is a flat, maybe an eggshell at best. So you don't see all the sand scratching, all of the problems that you will through a metallic paint job. So the bottom of the car, when you're painting it with body color, in this case, EV2 Hemi Orange, it has to be prepped as well as the outside of the car. You know, it's still the underside of the car, and some of it's original, and we had our guy body work the whole underside. So I DP90'd it first to ensure that I had no rust issues, I had good adhesion, it'll bite really good to that bare metal. Being the underside of a car, I don't know if he's gonna drive it, but it will take more of a beating. So I dp 90 makes sure that it just locks that whole paint job in. Then I put two coats of, pretty heavy coats of sealer because you kind of get blind looking at the whole underside. Did he get every single pit? Is everything perfect? So you put two coats of sealer on it because if you miss something small, that sealer is going to cover it. So by the time you get to your color going on it, you may have bridged over something very small and you got a good combination of product that will handle going down a gravel road, will handle being driven on the freeway. That's why all those three steps were done. Since we're not cutting and buffing the bottom of this car, I can do it in single stage. I can get it covered in three coats. I'm in there half the time, and as long as it's prepped right and you take your time, it'll come out not needing buffed, which it did.
There have not been very many cars come across our path that we couldn't restore, but on this topic, if you guys recall back, there was a real Charger Daytona that came to us back when we were at the old shop to try to have it restored. And I wanted to restore it, I really did. But unfortunately, there just wasn't enough car left. You know, when the guy brought the car in, I was optimistic until he opened the door on the trailer and there was nothing but parts in there. There wasn't even, like on our Phantom Coot, if you go back, it was a car. This wasn't even that, this was nothing. This was a rear clip off of another car, a rocker section off of that car. Because keep in mind, this car was at the bottom of a rock quarry up in Nova Scotia, Canada, where it had gotten pushed off 30 years earlier. So when this guy retrieved this car, there wasn't much left of it, except the guy who did push it off the cliff and say, hey, this is great filler material, later regretted it, cut out the dash VIN for it. He had the core support numbers, the trunk lip numbers. He saved a section of the quarter that had the Daytona decal on it. You can see all of that stuff. And that's all wonderful stuff, but you can't just put those things on another car or other parts and say, this is the car. There's not enough of the original car. Where's the rest of the car? I just think he took the wrong exit and was supposed to go to the scrapyard. Another great thing about when you watch back through some of this old footage is it reminds me how much I hated Darren. Is there anything really to start with? That's, I think, the bottom line here. What do you start with on this car? Just like with Brian's car on this Daytona, I actually conferred with Tony D'Agostino on that one. I called him up and I sent him a bunch of pictures. We looked at the pictures in real time together. He agreed with me. It's just not a complete car when it's done. Basically taking the numbers off of one and putting it on something else, and we just don't want to do that. So that car, unfortunately, also had to get knocked in the head. Mark had to help me move this car around with the forklift because every time we go to pick it up, it tries to fall in four pieces like a taco. You know, it's a convertible car, so there's nothing holding it together when the top's down anyway. Something like this, if it could have been taken care of, would have been really nice, but there just wasn't much left of it. If you go out through the lot and you look at the cars that have rusts on them, there's rust where you can put your hand right through the quarter panel, no problem, but the frame rails are solid, the floors are solid. Those cars structurally are still good solid cars. So the more of that rust that you have like in the frame rails and the floors and the under seat pan and the aprons, the more it compromises the integrity of the body. This car is rotten from the belt moldings down, literally rotten to a point where there's nothing. So when I raise the car up or try to raise it up on the lift, that's why it looks like a Lamborghini. The doors just kick up in the air like that. This thing is in bad shape. Every time we moved it around the lot, it would fold in half, but now you can see it. We go to raise the car up and it folds literally in half. So this car was falling apart so bad, I couldn't even figure out how to get it up on the hoist. Mark thought up the idea of using the hoist and the forklift at the same time to pick this thing up so the front end didn't just break off of it. All convertibles come with reinforcements. They have the angle iron inside the rocker. They also have the torque box at the front and the rear. I'm showing here that the torque box is completely gone from rust. The transmission cross member, I can literally bang up and down like this, like a rubber band. There is nothing left of that car. Okay, so one thing we have to do now is get under this thing and start trying to unbolt things. So normally we have a procedure to take these cars apart, but with this one here, it was quite a challenge. We just decided to use a torch and a hammer. So once we got everything unbolted, we were able to get the engine and transmission out, but it wasn't pretty. <laughs> so basically, Mark gave me a list of things to save, but it wasn't much. Okay, so today is the day. It's going Hemi Orange. I've already waxed and creased it. I just want to paint cars. Hi, Willie. I've already got the wax and grease done, so at this point, you go through, tack and blow it. I'm a good dad. I'm a good boss. I'm a good painter. I don't need to be Jaws. Get any little Getting ready dust. To paint. 
dust particles off the car, and then uh, we can start dropping our base coat on it. Looking good, William. When it comes to painting the car, I wait till I know when Mark's in bed. He's not a night owl. He'll be in bed by 6.30, taking his little slippers off, or whatever his routine is, his half gallon of NyQuil. In typical fashion, one of my rap friends around here, I don't know which one, obviously sold me out and, you know, shows how much pull I have around here. EV2? So, what color is it on the Dodge EV2? I always forget. So you guys at home, you know, if you get tired of Mark jumping in, Stuff like that. Hey, this is why you get over spraying your engine free to let, right here because to you, let you me have know. these little peekaboos. And then, Peek maybe I should try church. If I'm as bad as Mark says I am, maybe, you know, I need church. Rare car, my friend. Not well, rare. this one's a tribute to it. You know which one we're doing, Bubba? William? Are we getting along now? I'd like to, if that's okay with you. I would like to get along with you. Everywhere. Unless for some reason I have to correct you. It's kind of like a magician, right? My teaching style. It's a sleight of hand. He's so focused on hating on me for my ridiculousness, my silliness, as he would call it, that he doesn't realize he's actually learning something at the same time. He's hating it so much, he's actually learning something. I'd like to. <laughs> Just talking to a gentleman named Lloyd. From Dumb and Dumber? Uh, no, that would be what you'd go, no, uh, the Shinnin. With Jack Nicholson, Lloyd was the bartender, the make believe the bartender. I don't know what the Shannon is. I'd... The Shining. Oh, The Shining, yeah. Did you ever see it? Yeah. Shot up in Portland. You know, when it comes to Mark's movie references, he doesn't pick up important like plot points of the movie or something everybody that he's telling the story to can relate to. He picks the dumbest part that nobody even cares about and then tries to take credit like, oh man. And then he beats it into the ground. You know, stop him six months later. Put a loaded gun to his head and a firecracker up his ass and threaten to light it. I promise you, he will remember everything. And that's what teaching is about. Going to the ear with a point and the heart with a story. Whoa, a minute, hang one. How come you don't have the hood on, buddy? What's You're, that? Are you gonna do the hood separately? Yes. And the deck lid? Yeah. Remember that episode not too long ago where you were saying if you don't paint all of it at the same time on a metallic, it won't match? This is such a fine metallic, it's okay. So a lot of circumstances, these cars are too big to have a hood and deck lid in there with the car. So I'll do them separately. The air pressure, I have a digital little gauge on the back of my gun, so I know the air pressure is good. I, however many coats I put on the car, I put on the hood and the deck lid when I go to do them. So I've never had a problem actually painting them separately at all. Fine metallic. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. My only point here isn't to pick on him, is just do what your lips say you're gonna do. You can't go tell our people, our faithful audience out there, that because it's metallic, I have to paint the car all together and then decide later because of the size of the metallic, I don't have to do that. Well, all you're doing is keeping our audience on an emotional yo-yo. You don't deserve that. You know, I respect you more than that. I paint these cars apart in most cases. Uh, if it's a metallic, the doors will be on it, the fenders will be on it, but the hood and deck lid are off. So what we should have said in that episode was if it's a coarser metallic, you've really got to paint it all at the same time. You're the one that tells me what to say, sir. I don't know, when you do your interviews, I don't think I write them, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. You hear something funny? Yeah, I just did. Okay. When it comes down to it, Mark does write these questions to inform people at home, you know, so they know what we're doing, our process, stuff that they want to know. Belt molding car, G36 car too, Will. Nice. Dual outside painted mirrors. Are there provisions in that, by the way? Yeah. There is? But he goes so far that I have to go off script. Otherwise, if I go with what he says, it's gonna be nothing like, oh, Mark's the man, ice tray. He's got an award from Mopar. So they did add the second mirror? Oh, okay. Yeah. You just asked that. I wanna show. You gotta see those two little holes right there? Nobody cares. They just wanna see the cars get built. So I have to go off script. I'm a rebel. Yeah. That's, well, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to my audience. What I did is I just told Mark, hey, there's some attractive fan up in the office. Gone. Words of wisdom, Lloyd. Words of wisdom. Now that I got rid of Mark for quite some time, more than likely, we can get this car painted. Yo, know, again, this is my own formula. I got it mixed up. Looks great. Seven coats to cover. Hit it with that clear coat, and under the right lights, that metallic will just pop.
Previously on Graveyard Cars, we rebuilt, reconstructed, and restored this stunning 1970 CUDA 440 six-barrel four-speed. True or false, you could not get the shaker hood in 1970 on a 440 six-barrel CUDA. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. How did we do on that one? Honestly, this was a pretty easy one since we featured the answer many times in Graveyard Cars. True or false, the 1970 Cuda 446 barrel was not available with a shaker hood. If you answered that's a false statement and a lie, you are right. Absolutely it was. In fact, the shaker hood on the 70 Cuda was an available option with the 340, the 383 HP, of course, the 446 barrel and legendary 426 Hemi. Once we got the drivetrain out of the car, it was pretty much straightforward from there for the disassembly. This is classic Dougie right here. This is what I'm talking about. Looking, peering inside of it, pushing it out into the middle of the aisle he spots me, yells hey, at me, Mark. hey, Mark. Mark! I come running down there because I think something's wrong, right? He shows me, he holds the flashlight up and he says, look, what, what is it? I thought, well, maybe a, cr a critter's in there or something, you know? Gas. Can you see that? Yeah, it's gas. Yeah, well, it's half full. Yeah, it's a gas tank. Yeah, well, it's dangerous, it's flammable. Maybe even explosive. It's a gas tank. I, I don't get the question. I could have blown myself up. <laughs> Mark? Okay, so once we got all the parts off the car, I had to cut the aprons and the front end off the cowl because Mark wanted to save the cowl and the windshield as a single structure. So we did the same thing at the back. Mark wanted to save the unique convertible mechanism in the back of this car, so I cut it right across at the rockers. Now, another car that we have in the queue that we are going to save was burned like the Challenger that we crushed. But this car still has the original engine for it, the original transmission. It's a 70 Charger RTSE 440 automatic, and it's a loaded car. Quite possibly, when we're done running the numbers on it, it'll be one of one. All of the structural parts on the car are good, like on Windows car. Remember, we went through Windows car, and we determined that the frame rails and the aprons, everything down low was good. We just had warped sheet metal. That's what we have on this Charger. So stay tuned for that car to come through, because that'll also come back like the Phoenix Cuda. It'll be the Phoenix Charger. You walk the camera light across this thing and across the roof. In the camera, it looks shiny. It is actually really a matte finish. Now, I know Will gets tired of me going in and out of the booth, but I also try to educate my audience. In this case, I'm being serious. This car is a base coat clear coat, and I just want to point out that the base coat has to be top coated with clear. So when it's done flashing, when you've laid it out and you think you're done, you're not done because if you pulled that car out in the sun, that paint would blow off within maybe a month. The wind would literally blow it off. It must be top coated. So all I'm trying to do is trying to educate the audience. No, all. this is great. I love this. Stuff. Although I no, you're just, super informed lit. We'll do just the same. Thank you. Yeah, me and my wife See, went now out. now we're downhill again. Drunk. No, just, we're not just going anywhere. So, so when I'm doing this in my lit, as you would say. You know, air quote something, actually, it's going to happen. We're going to have, what? What did you, you just say out of your face? 
It's actually out of my mouth. You don't air quote something. It's actually your mouth is on your face. Not, not, uh. Well, you're welcome. I'm happy to help you anytime you need it. Just come in like that. And you know what's unfortunate? Give me it's actually very helpful because there has been times where I've needed his help, for One sure. of the best in the world, actually. And then that just ruins it. I'm Edward Van Halen. If I want to talk about how I was jumping up and down on Valerie Bertinelli in... <laughs> so this is why I get in trouble, is because of you. Yeah. So you, like we talked about in prior episodes where it just goes too far, he's so full of information. If he would just learn when to stop and see moments like this right now, this camera guy is focused, it's an intelligent conversation. The camera Corruption guy- Corruption man got a cigarette in there. Okay. You know how you said, now I know he died of cancer, that sucks. Okay. So he had a cigarette. Let's get this up shot. underneath the strings. In all honesty, I love working here. That's why I've been here a long time. Mark is like a pain in the butt, big brother. I love him to death, his family. I wouldn't trade this for anything. So I do three coats of the DCU 2002 Clear, and it's a thick product, so three coats is almost like four. As far as in between coats, stuff like that, it depends on what the temperature is, you know? It does change. I like to go by feel. You know, I'll kind of go touch the paper or plastic, and that'll tell me when. Usually it's 20 minutes to 30 minutes before it's ready to go again. But I like to keep the booth around 70 because I like to paint the layout. Just take your time. Just be cool. Put your coat on, let it move. Do the same thing three times. Then I'll let it sit about 90 degrees for a couple hours. Then at that point, I'll run a bake cycle on it. Because I have found before, if you try to run a bake too soon, you'll kind of glaze over the top and it'll solvent pop. I let that whole paint job just complete take its time and Noah thanks me for it later when he's got a buffet. If you were to kick the person in the pants that was most responsible for your troubles, you wouldn't sit down for a month. And that is Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy. They called him Teddy. It's Theodore Roosevelt. I don't even know if he had a middle name. He, he, he's Sam Jackson from Deep Blue Sea. I'm the shark, right? If this is Deep Blue Sea, he's Sam Jackson's character. All right, he gets ate by a shark, like Sam Jackson said. Who's the shark? I am. I don't care if it's a good guy or a bad guy or a villain or a hero. Okay, as long as whoever it is that I'm playing is cool. I don't mind being uh, Hans Gruber. Hans Gruber was a great villain. I don't care about yippee ki and all that silly stuff and his fake scars and running around smoking his camels and his Zippo lighter. I want to say cool stuff like, you're going to have to tell your brother that Carl is dead. That's cool stuff. I must have missed 60 minutes. What are you saying? <laughs> I don't care.